Hey gang, it's me, Dr. Steve. I hope you're having a wonderful weekend. I'm enjoying just a beautiful fall day here, but I just had to comment on the bombshell of the latest Twitter files dump. As I'm sure you all know by now, uh, journalist Matt Tybee, who dropped part one of the Twitter files, returned for part three. Part one, if you recall, was all about how Twitter employees Democrat politicians and deep state operatives, particularly from the FBI, colluded together to deliberately censor the New York Post Hunter Biden laptop bombshell that exploded on the scene uh, in October of 2020. We also saw how Katie Hobbs, you know, the secretary of state of Arizona, used the power of her office to remove tweets in direct violation of the freedom of speech of Arizona citizens who were concerned about election integrity. So in all due respect, I mean, Katie Hobbs is the last person on the planet who should be representing the virtues of election integrity. The second dump came via the account of former New York Times reporter Barry Weiss, and that dump confirmed that Twitter was indeed secretly blacklisting and shadow banning conservative tweets and accounts like Charlie Kirk and Dan Bongino, a number of lockdown critics, COVID lockdown critics and the like. With Twitter Files Part 3, we now have confirmation that Twitter employees did in fact inordinately censor President Trump during the election, while at the same time propping up Biden's tweets. And again, what needs to be understood here is that this is all happening as Twitter, at least as of October of 2020, Twitter was actively suppressing the Hunter Biden laptop bombshell as well. That suppression, along with the censoring of President Trump, of course, climaxed with what many believe to be, well, until it actually happened, unthinkable, which was the actual banning of a sitting president from Twitter. Socially and politically speaking, it was one of the most bold, audacious moves by a private company in American history because it, in effect, said for all the world to see that Twitter was more powerful than the presidency. Twitter had a social immunity that not even the president of the United States could challenge. And I mean, world leaders were shocked. I mean, if you recall, even the likes of Germany's Angela Merkel, Francis Emmanuel Macron, they all unanimously denounced Twitter for that ban. But what Twitter Files 3 reveals is how leading up to that ban, Twitter employees consistently favored Biden tweets while censoring Trump tweets. One of the examples given is how pro-Biden accounts were actually accusing Trump of trying to steal the election by deliberately slowing the mail down in Democrat heavy areas so that their mail-in ballots wouldn't come in on time and thus not get counted. I don't know if you remember this. And just in case you thought this was sort of a fringe conspiracy theory, it came at least in part from none other than Obama's your former Attorney General Eric Holder. So we're not talking, you know, peripheral or low-level tweets here. Anyway, executives at Twitter were alerted to these tweets questioning the integrity of the election by Democrats. And irony of ironies, they per all personally approved of them. They even approved, I kid you not, they even approved of a Democrat-led hashtag steal our votes trend that claimed that Trump would attempt to steal the election. And Twitter executives claimed that it was, quote, understandable and that it was, quote, a reference to a U.S. Supreme Court decision. We were also treated to a number of instances where the FBI reported tweets they didn't like, tweets that called into question the integrity of the election, which they sent to Twitter. They flagged, sent to Twitter under the heading of, quote, enforcement and Twitter employees promptly tagged the tweets as either fake news or went ahead and deleted them. Interestingly, Tybee notes that there were no Republican sources reporting tweets to Twitter. Now, they may have, but there's nothing there in the files, as it were. It's all FBI and Biden-associated reports and complaints. All of this, of course, proves what we already knew. Twitter, in the pre-Musk era, essentially functioned as an arm of the far left, throttling the reach of conservative accounts, all the while boosting the reach 
of those on the left, as well as suppressing the Hunter Biden laptop bombshell, all in collusion with the deep state, the FBI, so as to inordinately influence the outcome of a presidential election. Now, make no mistake, these revelations are having a devastating effect on the lamestream media. The legacy media up until now, or they continue to do everything they possibly can to cover up this collusion right? They alluded to it. There was that Time Magazine article on the so-called shadow campaign to save, to save the 2020 election, where they detailed a lot of, oh, you know, this vast and powerful network to ensure that Biden won. But it was more of an activist network, uh, you know, uh, unions and all. But it turns out, that what we now know in terms of the inside look we have into how the deep state conspired with Twitter employees to ensure that President Trump was silenced, censored, eventually blocked, uh, leading all the way of, yeah, to his, his total ban, uh, and the role the FBI played in suppressing the Hunter Biden laptop bombshell, even though they knew the laptop was authentic, as well as the deliberate shadow bannings of conservative voices, all of that has been effectively covered up by the legacy media over the last couple of years. They refuse so much to even acknowledge that anything like that was taking place. And so it seems that these revelations are having a comparable effect on the lamestream media that the implosion of the Russian collusion hoax originally had when MSNBC's ratings literally plummeted. I mean, Rachel Maddow basically ended her career after that. I don't know if you guys saw this, but it's being widely reported today that the ultra leftist Washington Post, you know, the paper with that pathetic democracy dies in darkness slogan, they've lost, I kid you not, they've lost a half a million readers over the course of the last two years. Interestingly, over the same, the course of the very time period that Twitter Files is talking about. It's an absolutely stunning blow to their bottom line. And keep in mind, this is all happening at the same time that 1,100 New York Times workers were staging strikes, calling on Times readers to boycott that leftist rag. As for the Washington Post, they're officially ending their Sunday magazine. That's gone, they don't have the money for it anymore. Uh, they've also had a series of layoffs, all as their bleeding customers. They've gone from 3 million subs in January 2021 to now just 2.5 million subs. So a loss of half a million subscribers. And there's no mystery to this. There's no mystery. The whole business model for any news media outlet is trust. The only way you could succeed as a news media outlet is if consumers believe you are a reliable mediator of information. If you're seen as nothing more than a propaganda shilling for, in this case, woke leftists, you're inevitably going to see an implosion in trust followed by a comparable implosion in your audience. And I think that's exactly what's happening to the legacy media. And with every new chapter of the Twitter files, we can expect that trust to even further erode, eventually ending the legacy media itself. As always, make sure to smack that bell and subscribe button, and you will definitely want to check out my latest video on Carrie Lake taking her case all the way to the Supreme Court, all as the recall efforts to get rid of that Katie Hobbs have already begun. You're going to absolutely love it. So make sure to click on that link and I'll see you over there. God bless.